yes hello everybody and welcome um so yeah my name is lorne and i'm a third year undergraduate student studying computer science at oxford university um and the project that i'm presenting today was a group practical project that i participated in last academic year um and so that was spring of 2021 and you might have like noticed if you happen to be watching the keynote earlier that was from Johnny, he actually mentioned that there was a team at Oxford University that like a team of students at Oxford University that created an editor for the micro bit. Um, and yeah, I was from that team of students at Oxford University. Um, the, the brief of the project given to us from the micro bit foundation was to create a prototype editor to be used in conjunction with the micro bit. Um, and that was before the Microbit Foundation started to make their new like uh, editor, which is currently in the alpha version. Um, so it's kind of almost to give, like to try things out and see what works. There are a few different teams that did this, um, but the editor is supposed to be largely for young teenagers or children around that sort of age who might not yet have had a lot of text-based coding experience. Um, they may or may not have had block-based coding experience, but we needed a very, very beginner friendly editor for them. Um, and some people might be asking why Python? You know, um, why do we want a text-based text -based Python editor rather than just allowing them to continue using block-based code? Um, and I'd say the answer to that is that if some of these young students want to eventually get a job as a programmer or apply to computer science at university or get an apprenticeship, then they'll eventually need to use text-based programming languages at some point. And Python is kind of easy as far as text-based programming languages go. So it is a logical first one to go for. Um, that being said, I remember my experience learning to program in Scratch, which is a block-based language, a little bit like make code that's also used with the micro bit. Um, and I remember when I was about sort of 10, I found it very difficult to start using text-based programming languages. Um, so I started using Scratch when I was 10 and it genuinely took until I was probably about 16 before I felt ready to use Python because the jump is so massive. Um, you know, with Python, you can get syntax errors and exceptions and it's all a bit overwhelming unless you have a lot of guidance. Um, so our editor hopes to like slightly small and like sm decrease the size of that gap a little bit. Um, so what I think I'm going to do is I'll just jump straight into demonstrating the project to you and explaining things as we go along. I'll walk you through pretty much all of the features. Some are maybe more interesting than others, but please do stay till the end because there will be a fun little duck. I think Johnny showed a screenshot of the duck in his presentation earlier. Um, so the first thing that anyone needs to do when they open our editor is to press start. So I'll just press that now. And what that does is it connects to the physical micro bit, which should already be plugged in by USB. Um, I've got mine here. And uh the micro bit like if the micro bit isn't connected by usb when you press start then it will show a pop-up message to tell you that um now this box on the right is where the student can type their code into it to run and it starts off with an example program i think this example program is actually the same example program as is in the like the more standard micro python editor um but it's just to give the student an idea of what python syntax looks like before they start and there's also quite a useful autocomplete function in this so if i type if i type d for example then display pops up straight away if i either press tab or click on it then it will insert it into the editor if i then press dot it shows me all the different things i can do with display which might be quite useful for a student that wants to explore some of the micro bit features that they haven't necessarily been explicitly taught they can just try things out and it shows them what options are available um so i'll just get rid of that uh by the way don't underestimate the importance of autocomplete in an editor for children slash teenagers because at least when i was a child i wasn't necessarily very good at typing and i think it is quite common for children not to know how to type so having a very good uh autocomplete function helps to alleviate the worry of typing struggles um preventing them from getting in the way of programming so pretty much the first thing that a student is going to want to do once they have a program will be to run their code, right? So I will just press run and hopefully you can see that it's running the code. If I just hold up my micro bit here, you can see that it's scrolling hello world, then it will show a heart and it will keep doing that in a loop. 
Um, of course, because it is while true, that means that it will never stop until I explicitly press this interrupt button here. But before I do press interrupt, one thing to notice at this point is that all of the buttons except for interrupt and help are grayed out. Um, and that's to prevent students thinking that sh they should be pressing those buttons at this time. Because if you think about it, it's not really clear what pressing run should do if it's already running. You know, should it just allow it to continue running as it was before? Should it restart it? So it's easy just to not let the student press that button. Um, another thing that you can't press slash do while the code is still running is you can't actually edit things while the code is running. So if I highlight this here and try to press backspace, then it will say cannot edit in read only editor. And the reason for that is because um, it's kind of a complicated idea for students to get their head around the fact that making changes doesn't actually affect the control flow of the program in real time. You know, if you make changes, then you have to wait until next time you run it before the changes actually take effect. Um, so to prevent students from just getting confused about that, it's easier just to, <coughs> sorry, I do have a bit of a cold right now. It's easier to just not let the students edit the code while while the code is running. So I will just stop it here by pressing interrupt. <coughs> sorry, I do have a cold, I'm just gonna have some water. Now, before we get on to any more interesting features, and trust me, I do think there are some quite cool features, I will just explain the difference between flash and run, because that is one area where students might get just a little bit confused. So it's good to make it super clear in the beginning. So you'll have probably noticed from my brief demonstration that pressing run causes the code to execute correctly. But what wasn't necessarily quite as obvious from the demonstration is that it sends the code line by line to the micro bit executing the code in real time without saving anything to the permanent memory of the micro bit. And I think that's quite useful for debugging purposes because whatever program was stored on the micro bit before you pressed run is the same program that's there after. So pressing run doesn't affect the memory of the micro bit at all. Um, in a similar way to run, pressing flash also runs the code. But the difference is that when I press flash, it also saves the code onto the micro bit in a way that makes the code stay there. So if I then unplug the micro bit from the computer and plug it into a different computer or even just into a power pack, the new code will now be there and it will be able to run. So that's just the difference between run and flash. So one of the key features of our editor is the tutorials on the left. Now these tutorials are designed to go side by side with the editor. So the student can be reading the tutorial on the left while editing their code on the right. This is kind of similar to the tutorials in the new alpha editor that Johnny showed in the keynote speech earlier. Um, we, we didn't have access to that editor when we made this one though. Um, so one of the best features of these tutorials is the fact that they are super interactive. So there are code snippets embedded throughout. And whenever I press run example, it will run on the physical micro bit over web serial. So if I press run here, then the word value will be printed out there onto the screen. Um, now it looks like it's happening on the computer because I pressed a button on a screen and the thing appeared on the screen, but it is actually running on the physical micro bit. So what's happening is through web serial, the computer sends the instructions to the micro bit and then the micro bit runs the program, finds that the word value needs to be printed and sends a message back to the computer over web serial telling it to print the word value. So it is still all happening on the micro bit. Um, now, another interesting feature of these tutorials is the fact that you can insert fragments anywhere within your code. So if I get rid of this while loop, I can press insert fragment here. And now this appears in the student's code. Um, and I think that's quite useful if the student maybe wants to take parts of the tutorial to embed in their own code and change things. Um, because the tutorials are by no means a strict instructions of exactly what you have to do. Students are encouraged to be creative. So they can, for instance, change little bits. Maybe they want to change the variable into their own name and then print their own name. So, you know, here I can replace the variable with lawn and then print lawn. You might be wondering why I don't just have the variable, uh, the string directly inside these parentheses. And it's because this particular part of the tutorial was about how variables work. So that's why we're assigning to a variable here when we don't necessarily need to. 
But if I now press run, then it prints my name at the bottom of the screen. So that's what this white box is here for. It's for printing out the, um, it's basically for any output that should be printed will appear in this white box. Whereas on the tutorials, it will appear directly below just so that you can see it where you press the button. <clears throat> now, my favorite of these tutorials is the Python errors tutorial. So I will just select that now. Um, and the reason I think that this tutorial is so useful is because teaching debugging techniques to children is very difficult because the best way to learn something is to practice it. But if, you know, as they say, use it or lose it. But if the students aren't necessarily getting certain types of errors all that often, then they won't be able to practice debugging at the point that they learned it. Um, you know, for instance, if the teacher teaches them what a value error is one week, and then it's three weeks later when the student naturally gets their own value error, they might have already forgotten um, what the error is by the time they actually get onto needing to debug it. Um, so that's why this error tutorial is so useful. Also, you know, students often get a little bit scared when they see an error message. I've done some tutoring before and the students will say, oh, no, it's broken. Fix it for me without necessarily even reading the error message or not necessarily reading the whole error message. So hopefully this particular tutorial will teach them to see the error message as a helpful tool that identifies the problem rather than a scary monster or something. And not only does this tutorial give examples of different types of errors, like you can see it mentions syntax errors and name errors, index errors, zero division errors, etc. But it also actually contains some challenges for the students to put their new knowledge into practice. And those are embedded throughout. So for instance, we've got a task here directly after having introduced syntax errors. It has task where the following code has one or more syntax errors and the student can then insert this code into the editor practice debugging at the point that they've learned it so that that knowledge will really um, get a chance to be put into practice. And we have quite a few of these tasks, including at the very end, we then have a super task where it shows <coughs> a like a block of code with multiple errors, all the different types of errors that they've just learned about in the tutorial, and they can put all their knowledge together into practice uh, to try to fix these errors. Um, and all of the other tutorials are similar in the sense that they have tasks embedded within. And hopefully this will give them brilliant practice with debugging. Um, and speaking of debugging, actually, this editor contains the debugging duck. Um, so if I press the help button right here, uh, the little duck immediately appears, ready to help the student through any problems they might have. Uh, intuitively, the duck already knows whether there's an error message displayed um, because it can communicate with the micro bit and it will even know which uh, error message is displayed you know whether it's a syntax error a value error which line it's on however the duck does hide some of its knowledge initially because it's it's designed to be a teaching tool a learning tool and if it just told the students the answers immediately that might um ruin some of the experience of having teaching the student how to fix their problems themselves that being said, um, if the student does answer one of the questions wrong, the duck will tell them. So for instance, there's currently no error message displayed, but if I click that an error message is displayed, then it will say, actually, I can't see your error message. So it does still correct the student. I will just try this again, this time answering maybe more correctly. Maybe my code doesn't do what I want it to do. And if I go down this line of questions, it will, um, the duck will suggest possible mistakes that are quite common mistakes students might have made. So for instance, if I press that my program does nothing at all, it might suggest that I forgot to use parentheses when doing a function call, in which case I'm just referencing the name of the function rather than actually calling it. Um, or maybe if that's not what I've done, it suggests that maybe I've just assigned to a variable rather than actually printing the variable. If the duck does give up altogether, it will just direct them back to the Python errors tutorial with the hopes that maybe a bit more practice with the challenges on there might help the student a little bit. Um, so this time I will try to actually create an error to show you what happens there. So as an example, I could intentionally create an import error. If I replace this lowercase m here with a capital M, then 
you know, Python is case sensitive. It knows what lowercase micro bit is, but it doesn't know what capital M micro bit is. So if I press run, it now hopefully will give me the, yep, yeah, there we go. We've got an import error. It tells me the line. It actually highlights the line as well in the editor to make it really, really clear to the student exactly which line has caused them the problem. And it displays the error message on the screen here. And I think that's much better than some other editors where the error appears only on the LED display of the micro bit, because um, in those editors, it sometimes takes a long time to scroll the whole error message because you can only display one character at a time on the micro bit. So that might confuse a student, or maybe they might not watch the LED display for long enough to actually read the whole error message. They might get, get bored of watching it and walk away. So I think it's a lot better to have it on the screen and visible. Um, so now when I press that error message is displayed and then it's something else and it's an import error, then the doc will explain exactly what an import error is. Um, you know, reinforcing the information in the tutorial about error messages, but also, uh, you know, giving the information to the student at the time that the student needs it, I think is quite an important idea. Now, if I walk through, uh, sorry, actually, if I say that I still need help, then this time, because the error message is displayed and it knows the line that the error message is displayed, then instead of just directing the student to the, er the tutorial on errors, it will actually be able to figure out whether the student is following a tutorial. So in this case, it notices the student is following a tutorial and it asks if they want to compare the error in the code to the example solution. Now, if I recall correctly, actually, I think I might have been on the tutorial about errors when I pressed this duck. Um, and the, this is the one exception to this, because if the student has selected the tutorial on errors, then um, it won't be able to compare the to the example solution because all the code examples in the tutorial on errors intentionally had errors because they were intended for the student to fix. So actually it mentions that actually I can see you're following the tutorial on errors and I can't simply tell you the correct answer because that kind of would be cheating if the, if the duck could just fix all the errors when the challenges are meant to be to fix the errors. So I will just quickly switch the tutorial to the one on Python language features and do the same thing again. Um, an error message display, you know, it reminds me which line the error is on. I'll go through the exact same line of reasoning again. And this time when I press yes, that I want to compare to the tutorial, it finds the closest matching line in the tutorial. So in this case, it notices and it highlights the difference between the line that I've written and the line that was in the tutorial. Um, I think one thing that's potentially important to notice is that this actually, um, this does it based on which line matches the close in terms of text rather than in terms of line number. So hypothetically, if I had inserted a bunch of stuff above the line with the error, then it would you know, still go further back down to the line with the error. Um, because it is not based on position and that i think is particularly useful because you know this whole thing about tutorials they are still designed to allow creativity so the student is very very likely to add extra things into their code that wasn't in the tutorial and that doesn't break the feature of comparing this to the closest line in the tutorial um so just to summarize the point of the duck really it's largely to reduce the burden on the teacher because the students won't have to ask as many questions to the teacher because they can get many answers from the duck instead. And it's also to build some independence when it comes to debugging, because if the student has used the duck enough times, then they'll be able to remember some of the questions that it asks, and then they can ask those questions to themselves rather than relying on the duck every time, which might be really useful if they eventually transition to a different Python editor like idle, which doesn't have a duck. At this point, some of you maybe might be a little bit confused. Um, you might be asking yourselves, you know, why is it a duck? Why not any other animal? Um, is there even a reason? And the answer is yes, there is a reason. And it's because of a concept in computer science known as rubber duck debugging, which essentially means that it's easiest to debug your code when you get the chance to fully explain to someone in detail exactly what's gone wrong. So, you know, programmers in the workplace might describe it to their coworker, and students with this editor instead can describe it to the duck. So that just about wraps up my demonstration of the editor itself. 
but I am now going to say some words on how you can use the editor yourself if you would like to. Um, so <clears throat> keep in mind that this is still a prototype editor, so there aren't that many tutorials in the tutorial list, and there definitely are some features that could be added, for instance, you know, a micro bit simulator um, or the ability to save their code. Um, however, if someone would like to try it out, then it is available online, um, it's still up and running, and you can access it. Uh, I've got the link at the top here, so microbit-team-12.github.io forward slash editor forward slash. And the source code can be accessed through GitHub. And I've got that here at github.com slash microbit-team-12 forward slash editor. I will be posting both of these links on LinkedIn after that. Um, I think my LinkedIn is available on my Hopin profile. So do feel free to check out that post if you didn't quite catch the links now. Um, one thing that is super important to remember though, if you're using our editor, is that you first have to have MicroPython on your microbit before it will work. Um, so you can flash MicroPython onto the microbit basically by using any of the other Python editors for the microbit. Uh, you know, do that once and then you can use our editor as many times as you want after that. Also, it only works on web browsers that have web serial enabled. So recent versions of, Cry, uh, of Chrome or Microsoft Edge will work, but I don't think it works on Firefox yet because I don't think Firefox has web serial. Um, you can always search up whether your browser supports web serial if you're using a different browser to the ones I've just mentioned. Um, and since I've got a bit of time here, maybe it's worth me showing you how to add to the tutorials if you want to because this is all open source and anyone theoretically can contribute if they would like to. Um, also, it might just be nice to see how exactly we made the tutorials. So if you go into the public folder and then tutorials, um, <clears throat> then you can click on any of the existing tutorials to have a look at them. So if I go into pythontute.md, this is the one about Python language features. It is in a language called Markdown, which is very, very similar to plain English. If I just go into the bit that shows me the original source of the markdown. Yeah, you can see it's very, very similar to plain English, just except that varying numbers of hashtags um, specify different types of headings. And you can do code blocks by doing three back ticks. If anyone's not familiar with markdown, um, it is very easy to learn. There are cheat sheets available online if anyone, if anyone wants to learn markdown. Um, and the thing that perhaps is a bit more unique to our editor rather than just normal markdown is the way in which you need to format the code snippets. So using this example here, um, this example here, when it says from micro bit import star, um, you know, that is very important in order to run pretty much any code on the micro bit because, you know, display, et cetera, is from the micro bit library. However, <clears throat> you know that we, um, so if you, if you remember on the editor, there was always that button um, on all of the tutorials, there was the button that says run example. So we need the from micro bit import star in, all, in order to run the examples. However, we don't want the from micro bit import star to be inserted every single time we press insert fragment, because you can imagine a student might actually insert lots of fragments and there's no reason to have the from micro bit import star several times throughout the uh, student's code. Therefore, the way to solve this is we actually have written kind of a special type of markdown uh, reader for the code snippets that checks which lines you specified up here that should be the ones that get inserted into the editor. So here I've specified using a hashtag that's just for a Python comment um, that it's lines four to eight that get inserted into the editor. So all of the lines get run when you press run code snippet, but only lines four to eight get inserted into the editor when you press that. So that's the only part of the markdown that's unique to our editor. <clears throat> and the, any, the other things that you need to do if you want to edit our tutorials slash add your own tutorials is any images in the tutorial you have to add into this image folder here. Um, for instance, if you were doing a tutorial that linked to the LED display of the micro bit, it might be useful to have some screenshots of that maybe in the tutorial. So you would just have to put those into images. Um, and the final thing that you need to do is add the name of your tutorial into the menu. Um, 
you know, so that it will appear in the tutorial selection pane. So that is if you go back to, I think it was an editor and then SRC uh, resources, and then there's just tutorial list.ts. So down here in the list, you would just do uh, within the curly braces, you'd have path and then the name of the file that contains your tutorial. So that's the name of the markdown file you've created and then title and then whatever you want the title to be displayed to the student. Um, and th that would be the title that it appears as in the menu. So um, I think that kind of concludes my talk. Does anybody have any questions? Just a lot of positive comments, Lauren, in the editor there, or sorry, in the chat. Um, Dr. Michael mentioning how well it runs on Edge on a Mac, so very smooth, well done. And uh, just, um, yeah, thanks and, and positive comments about the whole editor experience. I think it's incredibly cool that Johnny did such an incredible job setting up this conversation and then you're tying it all together. So he kicked off and you're wrapping up with um, the success of this editor. So congratulations to you and your team. Uh, I don't see any other questions here, but um, people are more than welcome to post. Maybe they're all poking around um, on the site. And if you want to put in your LinkedIn profile, you had mentioned about connecting. That would be great. People could just pop it in and, and take the time now to connect with you. Um, that's another great way to, to stay connected. Yeah, sorry, I'm trying to figure out how to find my LinkedIn profile to, to put it into the chat. No problem. And I hope that you're, uh, you'll have some rest over the holidays soon and that your cold doesn't get the best out of you. I'm sure it's a mixture of uh, cold season and, and doing a lot, um, like presenting it on a global live stage. So hopefully you have a restful day tomorrow but it was a wonderful presentation. Have you done this presentation um, before? Uh, I haven't done this presentation specifically before, but when we were doing, um, when we were doing the project, we had weekly meetings with Johnny from the Microbit Foundation. Um, and I think for part of that, he was on paternity leave. So there was also Matt from the Microbit Foundation that we presented to. We did kind of presentations every week. And then at the very end of the project, we did a presentation to some of our course mates that had, been doing other projects like um all the teams did presentations to each other awesome great it sounds like you're in a great program and you have a great group of um teammates working with you as well so nice to hear that um so happy computer science education week this has been a fantastic day to to kick off that uh and i hope that everybody has an opportunity to play with this and um access the GitHub link there to dive into some of the resources that Lauren shared and you'll see her LinkedIn profile there. So with that, I want to say thank you to Lauren for taking the time third year university. I can't imagine uh, thinking about presenting globally. So good for you and keep it up because people need to see uh, this program and how well thought out it is. And the fact that you're thinking through not just the user perspective, but you know, as a, an educator bringing it into a classroom, how it could be supported. So really thinking through the whole design process, um, very nicely done. And so with that, everybody, you'll notice that the event chat will still be live and we're going to be live on the stage at um, quarter two. So for me, that's 2.45. And for you, I believe it's 7.45, Lauren. Yeah, so we have about 10 minutes now. So one last opportunity to check out the networking section, check out the expo or poke into another session and check out their chat and grab some of their resources. But otherwise, we're going to close this out and we'll meet you on the closing keynote stage. Thank you, everybody, for attending. And thanks to Lauren. Big round of applause for your session. And we look forward to seeing you on LinkedIn and on social at hashtag microbit live. Thanks, everybody.